Oh. Oh. <laughs> Good. You were messy. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Alien Familiar RPG Podcast. I am Clayton. Kyle Perkins. KD. And Haley. Is here. I didn't get, get didn't really finish. I was not done. But thank you for interrupting me. Start over. Kyle Perk. <laughs> All right, before we get started, you can find show notes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. We are on Facebook, and we also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash alienfamiliarmedia. So if you enjoy our, our content and would like to help us out with hosting costs, any help would be greatly appreciated. Our topic for today, we are going to be talking about character advancement. We're going to be talking about game mechanics of character inva- advancement. Uh, different ways that it is handled, and we will also be talking about the pros and cons of using character advancement. And later on, I will be taking the position that you shouldn't be using character advancement in a lot of role-playing game situations. But to start off, we're well, just... I just want to say really quick that I think character advancement uh, is, is, is important. It's important to know the proper safety measures. Uh, Kyle, it's a lot like finding a gun on the ground. Um, you see it, what do you do? You stop... Don't touch. Leave the area. Tell your dungeon master. Yeah, and and so you you walk into your your gaming room wherever it may be, um, and you look and open. Lo and behold, is the player manual to the leveling up page. Immediately, don't well, panic. I'm going to take that one step further. You find a PHB. You don't know if it's open or closed, so don't touch. Oh, like it. Schrodinger's oh, treat, uh, treat PHB. every player's handbook as if it were open. Clayton, what are we actually talking about today? Well, character advancement. Yeah, we're talking about character advancement. Do you want to go into whether or not we should be advancing our characters right now before we talk about how you can do it? Because I'm, I'm ready to go on no, this No, no. Let's, 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 let's get more technical. Let's get a simple foundation. What is character advancement? Well, uh, character advancement, there's several different... Well, every game system does it slightly differently. From my experience, you can kind of break it down into two different ways. You gain abilities by reaching certain thresholds, or you have the ability, or you in some way purchase abilities using some sort of in-game currency that you have have acquired. D&D is definitely the, you gain abilities when you meet certain thresholds. You, You gain experience until you reach a certain threshold of experience, at which point you advance to the next level and you gain a whole bunch of abilities based on what class you are gaining a level in. Um, That's the most, that's D&D, the most uh, popular role-playing game in the world. Others do um, what I would consider where you buy abilities. This would be like World of Darkness. Um, Apocalyptia also does this, where each session you gain experience points and Once you have a certain, each ability that you're wanting to purchase has an experience point cost. Once you have that many experience points, then you can spend those in order to gain that ability or to increase an ability that you already have. Do you have a method that you prefer? Um, Well, I prefer um, where you reach a threshold and then you gain something. I don't like the, the tedious math of Saving up to buy an ability. Oh, see, I disagree. I pref- much prefer saving <clears throat> up and managing what I have because then I feel like I actually earned it rather than just, like, sitting on a clump of points and then, like, oh, these are the things I get and I don't really have a choice in what I earn where it's, like, I have all these points but I'm going to wait until save them to do this one really big thing. You don't play a lot of spellcasters, do you? Nope! <laughs> <laughs> see, if you were to play a new bard... You would be, because all the bard is now is a spell. Well, that's not true, but like a lot of spellcasting. Yeah. That, that is the most tedious thing, but in some ways the most fun thing about leveling up a spellcaster, we'll go with even more specific, is going through that damn list of spells. Oh, buddy. Even a cleric. Like, I'm playing a cleric in, in Kyle's game right now, and every level up, it's like over there writing down all the spells I know now, and like, and I know that the whole point of like... Now we're just complaining about spellcaster mechanics, but I know the whole point of spell slots is, and how many spells you know each day, is to, like, limit your, uh, having to remember all of them. Hmm. But, like, there's just so many. It's so hard. Well, it's telling that at the end of a 
you know, okay, guys, welcome to the game. Today you're leveling up. At the end of that phase of a session, my spellcasters are always, like, flipping through the book, like, just with, you know, their studious, like, nose pinch glasses all the way down at the tip of it, like, hmm, yes, oh, please, go on without me, I'll be a while. Flip, 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 and, like, all the fighters are done, you know? Yeah, because I just sh- sure do raise that constitution. Oh, I can h- hit things harder, that's it. <laughs> but yeah, um, um <clears throat> spell spellcasters certainly have more options to pick from, but, um, I don't know, I guess... With D&D, the system is just very so straightforward, where World of Darkness, depending on how you've been playing your character, you realize, oh, I think I'm more of a techie than I thought I'd be, so I might as well put some more into technology and science than I thought I would. Or this game is more political than I thought I'd be, so maybe I'll put some more into, like, streetwise and politics. Stuff like that. And I feel like with D&D, you can really only level yourself up combat-wise, where other systems allow you to advance on more emotional and mental levels than D&D allows you. Well, um, another system that does that kind of follows the D&D model but doesn't actually give you a full level would be Savage Worlds and that's where we that's the game system we played Athena in where you reach a threshold of every 5 experience points you gain what is called an advance. You can then use that advance to gain like you have options picking from the book of all these different things that you could gain. You could gain an edge. You could improve your skills. You could improve one of your attributes. I um, really loved um, the way that you did leveling up for Abena. I felt by the end of that campaign, we were all really well-rounded individuals that had truly gone through a war and this gigantic battle uniting all of the continents against a larger threat. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't remember, like leveling up every other session but I, I do remember every time that we level up we'd all have to like seriously think about what's going to better our character the most i really like that system a lot another way of doing it that's kind of similar to D and savage worlds uh, fate core system uses what is called milestones where whenever you accomplish a story um, like a story arc or you com- complete a, um, a major part of the campaign then you have the ability like you uh, you gain the ability to change your character in some way. Uh, you might move move your abilities around a little bit. You might gain a new a new aspect or something like that. But in some way, whenever you reach those thresholds of meeting story goals, then you would level up or you would in, you would improve your character in some way. Just gaining experience points, like I said, with D and D and Savage Worlds, that's not the only way that like. Even D and D itself does uh, gaining levels in a couple of different ways. Um, right now, I am running um, a Curse of Strahd adventure, and in the book, it recommends that rather than um, you gain levels whenever you gain certain experience points, you gain levels whenever you accomplish certain story thresholds, like you whenever you gain certain um, powerful items that are required in order to, or not required, but very useful in defeating the big bad of the campaign or whenever you defeat a certain a certain enemy or clear out a particular dungeon you would gain levels at those points it really doesn't matter how many <clears throat> how many zombies you kill you can literally the, just travel the road between two points doing an infinite number of random encounters and you're not progressing the story so your characters aren't leveling up Kind of unique among the games that I'm familiar with, there's also the way the Call of Cthulhu 7th Edition does reward, where it rewards your failure in using your abilities. Um, Call of Cthulhu is very skill-based. Whenever you fail a roll during the session, you put a little hash mark next to that particular skill, and at the end of the, at the, end of the session, you make a roll to see whether or not that skill increased due to your failure. And so failure is the only way that your skills can ever increase. If you succeed every single role, your character isn't going to advance. Oh, it's kind of like the U.S. Army way of doing things, you know? Pain is just weakness leaving the body. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think of um, the way we're doing it in the D&D campaign we're all in right now, where every other session you just level up automatically? I really like the fact that we're very powerful. We don't really get a lot of, ch- like 
opportunities to use some of our powers, but that's because it's not an extremely combat-heavy game. And I personally like that a lot, because I think that there are other aspects of the game that I enjoy more than the combat of D&D. I feel like because we don't get to use a lot of our advancements a lot, it doesn't necessarily bother me. And, and I like the fact that we do feel like we are powerful and important characters, because we are in the story. But like I said, I don't feel like we use a lot of our advancements a lot because D&D only gives you combat advances, never gives you anything else. Personally, I really like it. Um, I hate the tediousness of calculating experience points and at the end of each combat or each encounter or whatever, the, <clears throat> the game master tallying up the experience points that were there and then dividing it by the number of players with the table and then telling each player, this is how many you have now, and all of us writing it down and then adding it up to see whether or not we've reached the next threshold. I love that it's just, we know when we're going to be leveling up. My only critique of it is that I feel like it should be a little less often rather than every other session. But to be perfectly honest with you, that's only due to my own personal experience because back in college I ran a game where every other session we leveled up in D&D and I felt like it was a failure whenever I did it. And so I'm a lot more cautious about doing it that often. Well, here's my thinking. This is You're hearing it first now here live on the air. Um, y'all are at level 10 now, and I'm thinking about putting the kibosh on leveling up for a while. I didn't intend for the game to go this long. Fresh yeah. at level 11, by the way. I thought you were at 10. We, this next coming session. Oh, well, no, that's what I'm saying. You don't, that, that's not, not happening. Uh, uh, oh, like, you're canceling. Yeah, I, I, you're I, canceling I, the apocalypse. Leveling up is canceled. <laughs> um, but really, I, I'm actually thinking of doing it because, um, several reasons, but one, I didn't intend for this campaign to go on this long, and I'm ha very happy that it is, but now I'm a bit in over my britches, as the saying goes, I think. Um, you're at, I think we've played 21 games, uh, 21 sessions, rather, uh, and so you're at level 10, about to hit level 11, and early on, I kind of shied away from combat. I want to do more with it so you can use these abilities you've been getting, but I missed my chance to go to high school and take pre-calculus, and now I've been dumped into calculus D, you know, the fourth level of it, and I'm just like, yeah. oh, fuck. So, I need you guys to not become gods and just Boo. stay at, like, you know, uh, stay at, like, Heracles level for a little while, if you please. And uh, let me kind of catch up to designing encounters, because you guys have a lot of cool shit, and I want you to get a chance to use it. And you're also approaching a more tumultuous, less exploratory time in the game. And I will have enough to do to not have to constantly catch up to where you guys are at and design encounters appropriately. It would really help me out to design the next five fights. I think you might, you know, not, not design extensively, but flesh out somewhat the next five fights I think you guys might have, keep them in my pocket, and then if you guys trigger that fight, I've just got it. I don't have to okay. I don't have to reconfigure it for level sixteen players, you know? I think that's really good, especially because um uh we're we're currently at the Brian Wells and we're on our way to like the Bear's Deads and doing more political stuff. I feel like story wise it makes a lot of sense that we're not gonna be doing have a lot of time to like practice our swordsmanship or study more spells. We're in the middle of stuff. I don't know about you. My character always has time for all those things. <laughs> that and talking to my Not all of us could be perfect like Ralph. <sighs> Truly. KP, those are exactly the reasons why I, I that I experienced whenever I would I did it in college of doing leveling up that quickly. Players gain so many new abilities that they don't know the abilities that they have and the it's impossible for the game master to plan out an encounter because you have no idea what the players are actually capable of. Yep. And I sure even, don't. <laughs> even if you even if you're basing things on what they've already done, that's not going to stop a player from looking at their character sheet and realizing that they've, that they've had this ability for eight levels now, they've never been using it, and in this particular situation, it's going to devastate what you have planned. Case in point, I gave one of my players, apparently, a um, flaming sword that does an extra d6 fire damage. Don't remember doing that! And they just whipped it out in a fight, and were like, oh yeah, I have this flaming sword, I guess. They kind of forgot they had it. 
So, um, yeah. I don't want that to happen. I also don't want to cramp anybody's fun. I, I think most of you guys, it seems like, have enjoyed leveling up to this point. I, I've never personally played a and d character higher than level 5 ever in my life. It's really um, powerful. And so I, I don't want to say that you'll never level up again. In fact, you will level up more. But... I'm gonna have to change things Slow, around. Maybe, down. maybe every every four sessions. Maybe just for the shits and giggles of it, I'll try to do XP based leveling up, just for like a couple sessions. I want to see how that goes. It's it's a canvas at this point. I'm a tenured professor here, right? I can do whatever the fuck I want. You guys are forced to play my game. You want to see how it ends? You're at, you're at 21 sessions. You're not gonna abandon me now. They can't fire me. I'll do. I quit. Anything? No. <laughs> I, I just want to echo what everybody else said in that, like, I've never played a character this strong before, so that's pretty cool, and experience points are pain in the ass, so why deal with yeah, it? Oh, also, I'm seeing a lot of you guys um, experiment with multiclassing, which is super Yeah, cool. I've never, actually, that's true, too. Right. I've never multiclassed ever. This is my first hybrid character, uh, monk cleric. Um, and what I like about that, too, and I think this is maybe the point of multiclassing, is, like, I'm leaning way more on the cleric stuff now, I'm basically a cleric, but, like... Like, that's totally legitimate within the framework of D&D, which is pretty cool. Um, and I guess that actually kind of ties in to talking about character advancement. Haley, you had mentioned earlier you like the fact that you can, like, in World of Darkness and uh, Savage Worlds, fit your needs more. Yeah. You can kind of do that with multiclassing, you know? Like, we didn't have a healer, and so I Well, do you still of... know any healing spells? I do, actually. Proud. Yeah, I know a lot now. Uh, <laughs> clerics, they're great. But, you know, they, that was me shifting to fit a need, and also because I wasn't enjoying the monk path that I took. So I think there is a little bit of versatility there, you just have to look. But it is, admittedly, literally taking levels in another class versus just purchasing one ability or, like, yeah. adting points here. So maybe it's... No, I definitely just... think uh, multiclassing can be a lot of fun, because it gives you different flavors and complexities i personally wrote my character to a corner where it's like i sure am just a fighter but that's on me and um yeah i'm really excited to see how you experiment with how you want to deal with leveling up i think giving us more time in between leveling up sessions works really well thematically for where we are right now but so i would like to get to level 20 and be the coolest person in the entire universe that's kind cool. of wild. <laughs> um, I can't promise level 20. Boo. But um, I can't even what are you fathom. Good for? I can't even fathom a level 20 character. Like, <laughs> if you want, let's do it. The way I've always done leveling in any system that I've played, and this is probably. Because fuck rules. Um, I've always just tried to do a, like, everybody gets a level at the end of, the, of, a, of a narrative arc. Now, I've actually received feedback from players that. The more games they that, that worked pretty well when they were all relatively new, but the more games that they've played, and very with other people, you know, or they've started running games, that they're not the biggest fan of that. Really? Why idea. did they say? This is mostly just a personal problem, but I tend they, they tend to be low leveled, you know, because they don't. I mean, a narrative arc, if you're only playing like once every other week or even once a week, uh, can take a while to get through. You know, four to eight sessions probably if you're in for the long haul and so if you're running let's say i'm running a 22 session game and it takes them between four to eight sessions to get one level and you're not playing every week and you're not playing every week <clears throat> that's like you're probably at like level six maybe at the most by the end of that and like even if you love the story and had a great time i can definitely understand how you would be like but i'm only level six for all the cool things i did like if i was if you if you were having a fight against a god I remember this is one of my GMing sins. I ran a game for some friends back where I grew up, and um, the fi the final fight was a fight against this like awakened god creature thing, and they were all like level four, or level five, and I just homebrewed the stats for this thing, you know, and so it was more of a narrative construct. But like in hindsight, looking at that, like would level five or four characters really be able to fight like a godling or something? Probably not. Uh, and so that was where the unfortunateness of my, my own, like, idea of leveling up came up with. Because I was tempted to do, actually, what you were doing, Kyle, and do every other session, but then I was worried, well, they're gonna level up too fast. And, which, props to you and just, like, taking that fear head on, you were just like, that's fine. That's the thing. I was too stupid to be afraid of it. 
Interesting. <laughs> if, if you feel no fear, you're either very brave or very stupid. Or very stupid. I was very stupid. <laughs> but, um, yeah. I, I think that you can, by the way, run a game with lower-ish leveled uh, characters, and they still feel like people who can take on a god, or like gods themselves. I think a lot of that has to do with the frame of reference of your players. Um, if they're seasoned D&D veterans who have played a level 20 character in a 10-year-long campaign with their buddies from the Fraternity of Eagles down the road, they're probably not going to wow. be... <laughs> uh, is that a personal story here? Or it sounds a very specific I don't know. Example. They're probably not going to be super into fighting a god at, at level, level 4. Five. Yeah. Uh, or maybe 5. Um, but I think you can, especially in maybe like lower magic settings, where being a level 5 sorcerer means that you could fuck up just about anybody on the continent if no one else has those powers, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't want to get too far down that road because it leads into the is character advancement necessary conversation. We're not getting there yet. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to give like a frame of reference for how when I run a game, I usually handle leveling up. I'm actually thinking about trying to challenge myself in, in a game that I run every once in a while and like maybe starting, they're going to be level three and starting maybe trying to catalog XP and just like as shitty as it's going to be, like just try to force myself through it and see like if I like it or not, because I've never really done it that way. I've always just like looked at the idea of how it was supposed to work and been like, <laughs> uh, I flipped off the microphone. If you're going to be catalog, if you're going to be keeping track of all the experience points, um, if it, whether it's a face-to-face game or whether it's an online game, it's a lot easier in an online game because in an online game, you are posting how much experience everyone gets. So you can go back and count how much experience everybody has. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're just telling people at the table, I'm being generous, half of the players will not write it down. I'm being generous with the players that half of them won't. Uh, my experience is that more than half of them won't write it down. They'll either not remember to do it, or they won't be paying attention when you say it. And then there will be this huge disparity between the one person who writes down everything that the Game Master says, and the player who doesn't write down anything that the Game Master says. The player that doesn't write anything down will still be <laughs> at 25 experience points where the person who has written everything down, it'll show that they're now level 4. I feel very attacked by that statement. Uh, and I have a question. How does a dungeon master decide who gets how many points? Is it always an e- like an even, like, this is the total that could have been done today. I'm going to divide it evenly. Or is it specific to the game? Because I know I used to do it weirdly when I used to ran Vampire and Changeling, but um, I don't know. I just like homebrewing it however yeah. I wanted to. It really depends on the system because every system does it differently. Um, D and D, since third edition has done, everybody gets everybody who is there gets the same amount of experience points for the things that are going on. Um, vampire, ostensibly everyone gets about the same, but you gain a base number of experience points for just being there for the session, and then you people can get upvoted for getting additional experience points based on the way that they role played. Um, in Dungeons and Dragons second edition and before, experience points were a nightmare because you would have the um, the fighter of the group, or I'm sorry, the warrior classes. They would gain experience points based on beating a challenge, but they would also get bonus experience points based on the hit dice of the creature that they were fighting. Um, rogue characters would gain bonus experience points based on the amount of gold that they stole. Wizards would gain bonus experience points based on the number, based on the levels of the spells that they cast. It was a nightmare to keep track so of. Confusing. So you could just be like the sessions like winding down, and you guys are like heading back to the tavern. You're just like, I cast fireball, and that's the GM's just like, what? You're like, I, I cast it, and they're like, it, it had At what? It you had know? to be against a, like some sort of a threat of a target. Oh, so it wasn't you couldn't just video game like spam your abilities. I, at the I end tell of the a guy session. in a bar that his mother smells of elderberries. He starts to punch you. I <laughs> cast fire. <Fireball. laughs> but here's the thing: rogues didn't have that re- that prerequisite. As long as they took money, they got the bonus experience points. Oh, just... So if you stole from your um, stole from anybody, you would gain bonus members? experience points. If you, huh, whenever you, you defeated the. Whenever you defeated the dragon and got its treasure hoard. That counts. 
you got a huge plop of uh, bonus experience. Wow. wow. And this was back when the different levels, the amount of experience points that you needed to level up was different for each class. A rogue only needed 1,250 experience points to reach level 2. A wizard took 2,500 to reach level 2. Good lord. And the other classes were somewhere in between. So rogue was just broke. Gygax, what you doing? I I can zoom him. Ask him. (laughs) Dig him up, Haley. So something that we haven't really talked about is um, when we were first talking about this uh, podcast topic, my small brain was like, oh, we're doing character advancement. We're going to talk about story narrative stuff. And I know Clayton had brought up that there is a difference between character development and character advancement. Do you want to talk more about that? Yeah, just because you, um, because your thief is got a little bit better at picking locks doesn't mean that he's grown as a person. It doesn't mean that he is he has learned anything about himself. <laughs> uh, just being able to... Oh, well, he uh, may have get... learned if he was good or bad at lock picking. <laughs> But does that really change who you are? That's true, but let's say, for example, you you didn't have that skill at all, and you've been playing a pretty lawful good, or at least on, like, a true good scale, and then all of a sudden you learn how to do lockpicking, and it's the only skill that you use now. That's going to affect your character. It's going to probably change your alignment that you're doing more crime. Or if you're a bad lockpick, you just, like, maybe I'm not cut out for the life, and then you take points in Paladin. As soon and as I, it. Kyle Perkins, learned that I'm alright at lockpicking, the number of dates I invited girls on to break into abandoned stuff with me increased by 100%. <laughs> so right also, there, that's an example. Your dates with girls probably increased 100%. Ooh. Um, yeah, but that had to do with other developments. <laughs> I love character development, but thinking about how those things do affect your character... Thinking about how when you're at the Dragon Horde and there is a simple lock to open up this chest and you fail the lockpick roll and break the lock. That's that's a failure to lockpick one thing, but that would really affect you. I love that shit. It's my yeah. favorite stuff. Because um, I was also thinking, like, would you be not allowed to unlock certain skills because of your alignment or because of your humanity if you're doing World of Darkness? I feel like it would be so out of character... If you're playing, like, a perfectly straight-laced paladin, be like, I'm going to take sleight of hand and lockpicking, and I'm going to just go into crime. It's like, it's, it's going to hey, change evil people, character. Evil people lock shit up, too, though. Lockpicking does not beget evil. Yeah, but you can smite a lock rather than finesse it. I feel like... Yeah, but then they know. know you're there. Don't... St- stop stereotyping lockpickers, Haley. <laughs> I don't I, know. I just think it's an interesting conversation. Can you... Like, your stats make up who your character is in a way. It's more, like, it can't all just be roleplay. You need numbers, you have things that you roll, that's how the game is played. Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I I definitely do believe that a player should find a way to have the, ch- the mechanical changes that are happening on your character sheet reflect in the way that you play the character. But I think it's a completely different narrative thing to advance your character, for your character to develop is different from the the, the things that are on the page. Um, whenever, whenever I think of character development, I'm thinking of, like, in a novel, the way a character grows and changes over the course of a novel. Most of the time in a novel, a character isn't... Yeah, most of the time in a novel, a character isn't learning a whole bunch of new abilities over the course of the novel. There are some... There are... Plenty of stories where that that are um, case in point against me, where it's the hero's journey of a of a character growing into manhood and things like that. But Gary most, Paulson's Hatchet. But most most novels and things that I read, they happen over the over relatively short amount of time, like, and the character isn't gaining a whole new understanding of how something how they're able to do something. The things that are changing is their person, maybe their personality is growing. Maybe they're learning to, um, they're learning something about themselves. They're, they're gaining confidence. They're, um, they're learning the way that the world actually works or something like that. And I don't see that reflected in the way that the mechanical stats on a character sheet are played in a game. Um, the Jim Butcher books, um, 
Uh, well, I, I can't even remember what, <laughs> what that series is called and what the character is called. I've read five of them, and I can't. The Dresden Files. Thank you, God. The Dresden Files. Um, well, I was going to say, Clayton, thinking I was backing you up, that in an individual Harry Dresden novel, it takes place... It's a, it's, a, it's a hard-boiled noir book. It takes place over usually about 48 hours, maybe a week at most. And Harry Dresden, in that one book, doesn't really change much. But over the course, Jesus, there are a dozen or more books, and I've only read less than half of them. There is growth, there is character development, and he levels up his skills and gets new abilities and new resources and new allies and whatnot. I was I was presumptuous to think that you were going to argue against me. How dare you? I respect you, sir. But <laughs> but like a a big long book series like that, it's not a, an indi- an individual story where he's gaining these new abilities. It's over the course of a long time mm-hmm. in the story or in the in the reality of the universe that the story is taking place. And personally, I don't feel like a lot of the games that we have played have reflected these big long arcs of time. Uh, most of the games that we have played, with the exception of Abena, with the exception of your current um, game, um, and factions. Factions took course over the of took place over the course of about five weeks. Wait, what? Yes. I thought it took over the course of three months. I counted the days. What the fuck? Um, <laughs> you killed me. Wait, hang in on. Only five weeks. I'm not. I'm not going to address that. Uh, <laughs> five in-game weeks. Five in-game. Okay, because I because yeah. out of character. Out of yeah, it took, it took a us month. a lot of like. It, Okay. We played that over the course of like four months or something. But but I don't feel as though, at least in that game, we were leveling up that much, if at all. I know, well, I know we talked about this according the According to podcast, me, not at all. Apocalyptia is a, a but, pretty slow character advancement system. Mm-hmm. Five weeks. Whew. Well, I feel like that's where you need to have time skips come in, to some extent. Uh, even if it's not, you know, a like six-month time skip, giving yourself two weeks to a month after each narrative event, uh, unless you can't, I feel like then maybe you can start to rationalize gaining new skills and Mm -hmm. abilities and such. But like, you know, if it's literally, uh, or if it's like you're doing soft time skips, kind of like you do, Kyle, where you're just like, yep, you're on the road, a week goes like travel time, right? Like you're you're on a boat for two weeks or something. Quickly, I was going to say it feels longer and after you're done, I'll talk about this. But in, in uh, my current game, The Wanderers, um, which is what I'm calling it, I guess, it's only been a couple of weeks since you guys kind of left, hell, maybe less than that, ten days since you left Northmore, the main first city. But anyway, um, I do like travel time skips. Like, yep, okay, it takes you 12 hours to get to your destination. You leave at 7 a.m., you get there at sunset, you know? Like, mm-hmm. that. nobody wants to spend too much time traveling, unless you have cool shit happen along the way, but... Yeah, and, and like, you know, not everybody, you know, needs to have that, like, six-month, like, every, like, the fucking, uh... Uh, a time skip of like, yes, for six months we as the party shall separate and go off and like train and learn new skills from our various mentors and like go to a magical college and then when we reconvene to fight maybe a great threat, like we will all be stronger. I could see maybe doing that like in one game depending on the circumstances, but like to have to have every in every game to like justify character advancement being like, yep, a six month time skip where you guys get like one level up. You know, because y'all go off and like really bust your ass. I feel like is is a bit rough. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I do like time skips a lot, and I feel like it's a good thing to incorporate in your game, and especially to show growth and advancement, uh, both mechanically and narratively. But well, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. I think hopefully you guys got some of what I wanted. The reason why I see that not happening is because the majority of the games that we play, there is something going on that that prevents our characters from wanting to take a span of time to do anything other than tackle the problem. Hmm. Um, I feel like if you're not playing an active character in the story, then it's not a very good character. Why would you want to focus on something that's not the main plot? I think that goes, I mean, now we're getting off the rails, but I think that also goes to the type of stories that we make Mm -hmm. in this group of like, and, and I do it too, you know, of like, there's a big thing going on. It's urgent. You got to deal with it. But, 
it's not a matter of like like we we like big overarching storylines mm-hmm. um so it's less so like y'all gotta go beat this necromancer it's a four session arc you do it there's nothing else super pressing going on you might as well take that like couple months to train or like go do something else you know usually it's like well we solve one problem but the bigger problem's still there and there's three other smaller problems and and i think that, that that's a fun way to run a game um but i think that's also why we don't really have that mm-hmm. time that you're talking about, Clayton, to like have the time skip and rest is because it's literally just a matter of like, you know, uh, why would you stop and do something else? Yeah, like, why would you take any longer of a breather than a couple days when you know that like the dragon is coming mm-hmm. and no one can stop him, but maybe you? Yarthmore's forces will be here in 12 days. Um, so you guys want to go and, like, check out that dope-looking fountain in the city square? We could, like, see who built it, maybe track it, do, like, a, do, like, we could, we could train with the masons of this city. That'd be fun. Yeah, how long would that take? About four days. Sick! <laughs> <laughs> that leaves us eight days to track old Yargaloth. Uh, oh, but fuck, I gotta, you know, just... Go home and see my wife. That'll probably take about two days. Yeah, travel time. Um, and yeah, I know, Kaylee, you really wanted uh, to go not be an orc anymore. Yeah. So, like, really that'll important. probably take another three days. And then, shit, Clayton, we're left with just one day. Would that be enough prep time, do you think? <laughs> one day? I don't know. Hmm. We're level 10. We got it. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> Kyle, we're getting another level up, right? So, like, <laughs> we, we, we got this. Uh, this interactive role play. Brought to you by the Alien Familiar Podcast crew. Uh, how 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 long will these tirades actually continue to have any relevance to the point? Your guess is as good as mine. Oh, we that ship has sailed <laughs> <laughs> long ago. Well, what I was going to say um, about Yargaloth. Uh, no, about travel time and um, pacing as it relates to character development. Something that I've experienced in this, which is now the longest game I've ever ran. Is, an, is another disconnect with the headlong rush towards character advancement may have, I, th- I think does have an impact on the pacing of your game, or at least the player's perception of that pacing. You guys have said, uh, yeah, this and Ibena, you know, they, they both felt like very kind of long, sort of uh, epic, uh, overarching storylines with interspersed side quests, um... Really, my game here right now hasn't been that. But you guys have hit level 10. You guys have been leveling up constantly. Um, Another reason why I want to slow down your leveling up is that I want there to be, since we seem to be enjoying playing this game, I don't want the party to feel like they have to rush to face the final boss. I'm level 10. I've advanced to a point where I'm ready to take on anything. Let's just finish this. I want you guys to have a little bit of fun and do some things that are related, capital R related, <laughs> but um, not associate your character sheet growth with, well, the story's about to wrap up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to take the next 12 sessions to do my romantic side quest, so it's fine. Great. I love it. I want to study with the Masons. I want to look at that fountain. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Can I, you know what? Where's the profession skill? Why did that get taken out? I would like to earn a very limited amount of money that is nonsensical and non-existent in the current economy in the game. And just mace, do some masonry. God, the weird, the f- weird economy of Dungeons and Dragons. The rules for that are in the Dungeon Master's Guide under downtime activities. Ooh. All right. I feel like it, it is both good and bad, you know, like, if if you decide, I want to, even though we have this pressing thing, I'm, I want to go out and, like, kill these wolves that have been stalking the local shepherds. That's cool. But at level 10, for example, like, you're probably going to blow through that fight if the wolves are just used straight from the Dungeon Master's Guide, I feel like. You know, like, <laughs> not going to last very long. What if they're magical sentient wolves? Well, you know, that's bullshit. And it's just another reason why no one should play D&D. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know how I, how I feel, honestly, on a lot of this topic, because, like, I think that getting new stuff is fun, and I think that people like it, but matching that in-universe can be very difficult. Also, handling whether or not you not necessarily deserve it, but, like, how, how exactly did this come about, uh, you know, is very... 
off um, sometimes. But then, you know, if you try to really adhere to those rules, I, I feel like you might get a little player pushback of being like, well, I've been like level three for eight sessions. You know, I'd like to be level four soon. Especially because, like, if you're playing with people that are invested in your narrative, but also like their build, they want to get more access to the things in that build. If you're, like, holding out, wait until you finish the arc, I can see how that might be a little frustrating for a player that's like, well, I, you know, we were level three for this whole thing. If I had been level four, uh, I probably could have had this ability that would have made this and this go better. You know, like, just, I don't know. I, I think it could be a tough call to make sometimes, too. So this is a callback to something really old. I know Jordan noticed it because he told me, he mentioned it at the time. But during the Abana game, did any of you notice that in the final eight sessions you didn't advance any? Nope. I figured that was just because we hit the limit. I didn't know that much about Savage Worlds, but I thought that we hit that final threshold. And then there wasn't really anywhere else to go. I stopped because I noticed all of the players sitting around the table when it came time to advance their character, they were just looking to see what they qual like what they could now take. They weren't they weren't developing their characters toward anything anymore. They were just taking the things that they now qualified for. Yeah, I like understand the difference. I know I was doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, let me see that book, Clayton. I have to flip through to see what I might yeah. want. I have an advance. I don't know how I'm going to spend it. That's yeah. everybody reached that point, and so I just stopped advancing your characters at that point. You had already, you had already gained everything that you wanted as far as the stats. So this was the just rest, scraps. The entire rest of the campaign was character development rather than character advancement. And that's, and that's how I define the difference between character advancement and character development. Because even after I stopped giving out experience points, after I stopped giving out advances, your characters were continuing to grow. Your characters were continuing to change within the narrative of the story. Um, Haley, your character grew more than anyone else during that time because your character finally met your father. Kyle, your character fully came into his own as the master of the... Um, I can't remember the name of the, the city. The Wind Tamed. Yes, the Wind Tamed. Um, so your characters continued to grow, but it wasn't growth on a character sheet. Interesting. Which is another reason why, and uh, this is related to the podcast, I'm not just harping on my own game here, but it's it's the best example I have of DM experience now, to be mm-hmm. totally honest. Um, it's why I don't want you guys to stop leveling up. You've hit level 10, I'm not saying, no more leveling! Because I'm looking around the room, and everybody either after the game or during the game or during the level up session at the beginning of every other session we've been doing, I see you guys talking about and actively thinking, you know, oh, I might try to multi-class Paladin. Oh man, I'm working towards this. I'm working towards that. I, I want this particular spell. Um, that, that, I think that's a really great rubric or um, not quite the right word, but a really great signifier of when your players want that advancement, that character advancement by character sheet. And not everyone does, um, but I think most people in this group seem to. So I, I'm not putting the kibosh on it. We're just going to slow the roll. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm very happy with that. And Kyle, it sounds like in your um, online game, it sounds like people want to level up More. as well. Yeah. Um, and like that's why I'm trying to evaluate how exactly. I, I'm actually tossing around maybe doing, like maybe not every other, but doing like maybe like every three sessions you get a level up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, just because, like, people, I feel like, want to get more access to things, and if, you know, you're doing a, again, four to eight session arc, and then you get a level at the end of that, like, it probably should be a level up in, in, in there somewhere, mm-hmm. and then one at the end. You know, like, like does that make sense? Like, yeah. Like, at a midway point, mm-hmm. you know, you've fought enough stuff, you've survived enough stuff, you've, you've started to make headway towards your goal of defeating this person or rescuing that person, you get a level up. And then for the home stretch, you you finally do the thing, you know, you get that second level up. Hmm. And I feel like maybe that could be a good way to do it, too. Yeah, I, uh, in the campaign I was running, I did it every three sessions because narratively, I was trying to make it like every three sessions they discover something plot related that they'd have to figure out how to interact with it. And that would change what path of the story we were going towards. But I stopped playing the game at level three because we haven't met in over two months. So they're just sitting on that advancement. But yeah, I think I think 
that works really well, having minor story plot points that advances them. I just love the idea of both as a player and as a GM of the str- the struggle. Not the class <laughs> struggle, though I love that too. Um, but in fact, the struggle of getting that level up after hardship, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and then you do get that session break. You know, my, my players at least like a little bit of a breather. Yeah. Um, so most of them do. There's There's one who won't be named, but he knows who he is. Uh, <laughs> whom is is more like let's just do the next thing uh, I want to level up more but you know I, I just love that idea of like you, you've you persevered bask in the glory you know because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not a big loot person personally and I, I need to be better about that that's actually kind of a weakness of me running games your reward I suppose is this level up mm-hmm. um, and maybe some narrative things versus like your reward is some experience items and some gold yeah you know um and and i think that that's actually going to just bleed down to both personal preference and the contract you got with your group you know like my group is relatively okay with that idea even though i'm like experimenting and deciding how i want to do level ups another group though might want that standard xp gold and some magical items or something you know so i don't know um, personally, I'm very much in favor of what it sounds like your system is, where the characters achieve something in game, and and they are rewarded out of game with with stat improvements or yeah. character improvement. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's my preferred way of doing it. If it feels like your characters, if your characters are or your players are saying that it's taking too long to reach their next level, you might want to do like shorter arcs, like find a way to. If you've got a lot of information that you're doing in a particular arc, find a way to break it up into two separate arcs. And that yeah. way, I am long-winded, <laughs> unfortunately. So that's that's good advice, too. I just want to point out, or just call out, a time when I hate character advancement. A particular, okay. a very particular type of game that I hate character advancement. And that is in superhero games. Because mm. what, what are you going to do? Right. Like... I recognize that, like, in the story of, like, Spider-Man, he gains all of his abilities in one go. (laughs) He may learn new tricks to do with his webbing, but he's not getting a whole new suite of powers at regular intervals. And even when... And I am by no means a big comic book person. uh, I'll be honest with everyone here. Most of my knowledge of Marvel comics and DC comics came from... When I was a youth, there was collections of, like, character bios and info uh, yeah. for each, for Marvel and DC, and these were mm-hmm. huge encyclopedia-bound books, and I would flip through those all the time, and, and, and they had, at the time, up to current, like, storylines for each character and powers and such, and so that was why anything I know comes from that. But anyway, mm-hmm. full confession aside, there was a point where Superman gets, like, cosmic powers from, like, a downed spaceship or something, but, and, and this is something a lot of comics do, is they'll give a hero this new set of powers or this new suite of powers for a bit, and then inevitably, though, they will always regress back to just that base standard, yep. you know? And, like, that wouldn't be, a, that would be no fun in a game to, like, get new things, and then five sessions later you have to be like, ah, they're gone now. Yeah. There, you know? are, there are a few different types of characters who do basically gain more power. Iron Man is constantly making new inventions. Batman is constantly making new inventions of toys that he Bat uses. Inventions. Yes. I guess, like, Doctor but, Strange can learn new spells. Like, magic characters can learn new spells, but, like... But that takes a lot of time. Yeah. Like, and it's not the the scope of most of the... Well, any of the superhero games I've ever been a part of have ever had that big scope of time of... Like, in the Doctor Strange movie, that that movie took place over the course of several months, possibly even years, because the timeline's never nailed down, of him gaining all of this power. And then he was with Dormimu for, like, ever a century yeah. or something. <laughs> or was Dormimu with him? Yeah. <laughs> Dormammy, I've come to bargain. <laughs> now, that is a fair point, and I can definitely, I, like, 100% agree with you on that. It's, it's tough in that situation, because, like, what are you going to give yourself? Especially if... If you're playing not Aquaman, are you? Do you mean to playing tell Namor, me? Playing Namor, then. 
Sure. You're playing Prince Namor. Um, all of a sudden, you mean you're just going to be like, yep, I now have a suit I use. Is it a, is it a submarine, like, submersible suit thing? No, no, no. It's, I, I'm now, like, also Iron Man, but also <laughs> while being Namor. Ooh, at level 12, I gain control of turtles! <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, or, because that's just so weird to me, to be like, because in the game, I guess, the mechanics, you could definitely maybe do something like that. Mm-hmm. But it's a superhero game. Why the fuck would they would that happen? Doctor Doom is a fucking mess because not only does he like weirdly <laughs> know magic, but he's also like kind of inventive too. So you're just very like, inventive. What the fuck's going on there? So I guess maybe that makes a little bit more sense. But like, I don't know. I was trying to think of a very absurd hybrid between Namor and something else. I guess like maybe Namor and like a fire guy. <laughs> oh yeah, like Johnny Blaze from the Fantastic Four and Namor. You're playing both of those characters at the same time. Guess what? You're the most useless fucking person ever because you can't use one of those two things in your other in the other environment. Mm-hmm. Okay, but what if Namor went to space, right? Like the Fantastic Four, he got <clears throat> caught in a cosmic blast and he received those powers. So he's Spider-Man. Okay, yeah, but like, okay, what if Superman got bitten by a radioactive spider and now he's so he has Superman this... with Spider-Man but he powers? Spider-Man same... wouldn't penetrate Superman's skin. But also, wouldn't he have just the same well, powers he already does besides the web thing? What if it was Krypton, crypt, a Krypton spider? A Krypton spider. spider. A Krypton spider with kryptonite fangs, so it pierces his skin. Then he just dies. <laughs> anyway, bite? we're not getting anywhere with this. I agree with you, Clayton. I think that leveling up in superhero games is pretty silly. I would even go... I would also go the complete inverse of that. In that, like, a super hardcore survivalist game... Sure, you would be getting things to, like, help you survive better and such, right? But, like, let's assume it's an Apocalyptia game where there's not a supernatural threat going on, there's not people trying to kill you or anything, it's literally just your plane crashed, you have to... It's like a, that game that you played, Kyle, uh, with the winterness. The winterness, that's a word. The, the winter <laughs> oh, wilderness. Uh, the, the long, long dark. The long dark. Um, yeah, it, it, you, or aside you, from wolves and shit, you are you know? surviving against the elements, and there's no apocalypse coming necessarily. Um, like, would you really need something like, or would you even want like coordinated march, you know, or like sharpshooter? Does that make sense? You guys kind of get where I'm coming from. Yeah. I guess a lot of the development in that experience would come after you've survived a while and either found a safe place to be. Or you've gotten out of the wilderness and you've thought back on your time there. Gary Paulson's hatchet. <laughs> it's all, it all ties back. <clears throat> but during that experience, you're pretty much relying on skills you already have, with the exception of maybe improvising a few new tricks. Sure. Like spinning. <laughs> it's a good trick. <laughs> I'll try that sometime. But yeah, like I feel like in that case, character development, it has to be more of the... It's more of... Or er, character... The, <laughs> That's more character development, not character advancement. Mm-hmm. Because, mm-hmm. like, yeah, I don't know. I, I, so I feel like those two extremes lend themselves poorly to character advancement. Mm-hmm. Any, I feel like any game that is over an incredibly short amount of time in-game is a poor choice to have a lot of character advancement. Now, an exception maybe being you're playing a game where you wake up, we're, like, trapped in a laboratory, and... Even though it only takes place over maybe a week, you're learning about yourself and you're learning about, like, you're getting new abilities as, like, your body's adjusting to whatever experiments were run on you or something. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would be a little bit different. And then the mechanical side of that would be, like, every session you pick a new thing to have happen. But in that Um, instance, your campaign is the origin story of the superhero. It's not the life of the superhero after he's gained his powers. Yeah, Yeah. living, like, doing your 9 to 5 superhero duty. Haley, you've always said you wanted to run a My Hero Academia game. I do want to do run a My Hero Do you Academia feel game. like you would run into this problem? Um, I understand that that is an anime, and so that kind I of feel lends itself differently. But... The way that I think I would run it is... I don't know if I'd use the World of Darkness system, but, like, for example, in World of Darkness, you have your powers. You already know what you can use. And uh, you could just keep continuing learning how to use the new, kind of like how Deku finally discover that he has fucking feet and can kick instead of punch. It only took him, like, three fucking seasons. But I feel like in the game I would want to run, it would be based off of 
how much you <laughs> how much you pay attention in school, but like practicing using your powers. Um, if let's say you're like Bakugo and you like sweat glycerin and gasoline, and you're just real sweaty, explosive boy. You expand your range depending on how often you use it, and every time you level up, you find new ways to use your sweat and get more damage bonuses, probably, Mm -hmm. Um, and just get more powerful, but it's not like you're discovering you have a new power. It's just new ways to use what you currently have, and I feel like that's also very on brand for the universe of My Hero Academia, because every character already comes in knowing their powers. Mm -hmm. They just don't know how to specifically perfect them and that's why they're there to learn but it also sounds like this this story is also the origin story of these characters how not maybe they already have their powers but it's this origin story of them learning to use their yeah powers. and i i really love origin story arcs uh, i tried to do that with my um <laughs> so does hollywood <laughs> not not geist um kyle what was that um god's game i ran Scion? Scion. I tried to do that with Scion, and it epically failed, where uh, the characters, uh, and you came in late to the game. I did. But my characters, uh, they didn't know that they were Scions, and the first session was them discovering that they were, and then they were instantly told that they had all these powers and had to figure out how to use them. I'm like, oh, narratively, that works really fun. Mechanically, it's a fucking shit show, and I shouldn't have done it. But I don't know, I feel like those those stories are very interesting to me, rather than people who are already sure of themselves and know their powers. Mm-hmm. I guess in a superhero setting, at least. Do we have any other points, or do we want to move on to geek things? I can talk to myself to death. <laughs> you got any stuff? I'm pretty good. Well, okay. Um, I recently watched uh, the Netflix series Love, Death, and Robots. Um, it's very good, <laughs> and if you want inspiration for uh, playing an RPG, there are several episodes that are really good for that particularly um sunny's edge good hunting and i would love to play a game set in the world of good hunting shapeshifters and the secret war are all really good like kernels for building a really cool world to play an rpg in what is love death and robots exactly it is a um it's an anthology series of each episode is between five and probably like 20 minutes long and each one is its own self-contained story. And it's all animated. Either traditional hand-drawn animation, and it also go- goes all the way to like hyper-realistic CGI. And I'm pretty sure that on um, at least uh, the Shapeshifters one, they actually took motion capture of people in a real setting because the backgrounds looked so real. It I do not believe that they were computer-generated. Well, um... My news to contribute is that uh, NASA, in gearing up for its Mars 2020 mission, which is a rover we're sending, uh, set to launch in July of 2020, um, they've just announced that they have the payload capacity and desire to send along uh, the first aircraft that will fly on another planet. Aircraft requiring an atmosphere to operate, requiring air. Um, They're sending a small helicopter drone. Um, It's about the size of a softball. Um, If the drone fails, it will not affect the rover mission. But if it succeeds, it'll do some cool stuff. Mostly, I I believe it's being used as just a proof of concept that we can do this. Uh, Mars' atmosphere is extremely thin, and so to fly just above the ground, essentially, on Mars, it's the equivalent of flying um, here on Earth at about 100,000 feet which 30 to 40, I believe 40,000 feet, is right where you see um, the upper limit for most standard aircraft we fly here on Earth. So the atmosphere is really, really thin, and this little softball-sized UAV is going to have helicopter blades that spin something like 10 times faster than a standard helicopter uh, here on Earth. Uh, I think like 3,000 RPM, uh, which is pretty darn cool. I believe they intend to fly it for not a long time. It was on the order of just a few minutes of flight time, essentially. So it's it's a little proof of concept, but as a big aviation nerd as well as a space nerd, having something flying on another planet... Now, mind you, this doesn't really take into consideration the Soviet Venus missions that used um, balloons 
to uh, basically picture like a hot air balloon with you know a white balloon with CCCP emblazoned on this thing in red text. Um, suspended from this balloon is a hardened, protected uh, probe ballooning the atmosphere of Venus. That really happened back in the 60s and 70s. Um, but anyway, um, it, 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 this is truly an aircraft. You know, it, it uses Bernoulli's principle. Super neat. Check it out. Well, we all know that when it comes to aviation, lighter than air doesn't count. Fair enough. Um, balloonists <laughs> are uh, hacks, and they deserve to be shamed publicly. If you know a balloonist... Find him or her, drag him out into the street, Just and beat him. Sh- beat him. Shout shame. Shame on you. Good old, good old fashioned tar and feathering. <laughs> um, I watched two movies recently. First one was uh, called Black Sea with Jude Law, and it's a really intense, very well shot submarine disaster movie. Just a really great film. Not much more to say about it beside that. If, if you like disaster movies and intensity, check it out. Uh, I also watched a horror film called The Void recently, and it was also a very good movie. If you like playing RPGs in which you have a horror setting, this will resonate a lot with you. It kind of felt like a Hunter one-off or a or a Call of Cthulhu game, uh, and I won't spoil much more about it than that. But uh, oh, warning: if you're not into gore or like body horror, don't watch it. It's not for you. <laughs> um, but if you like stuff like The Thing. Uh, definitely check it out. The thing is so scary. Like, the first ten minutes they kill huskies, and I've never forgiven it for it. Those they were infected. Would you have preferred the dogs spread the disease? Yes! I would love... I, also, those were no world... longer alive. The huskies had already been killed by It was a mere facsimile of a husky. Yeah, it wasn't a real husky. I mean, I was... I mean, I don't like seeing huskies get hurt either, Haley, but, like, I, I want to save <laughs> they mankind. They were just good boys! They um, were dead. I have two things. One... I'm in a burlesque troupe, and we have a show coming up on May the 4th, uh, which is International Star Wars Day. We are doing a all-nerd-themed show. It's going to be at Athens Uncorked, which is a little wine bar that's a bit down from the skull in Athens. Uh, so if you're in the area, come check it out. Uh, we're not just doing Star Wars. We're doing um, DC. Someone's doing a Mario number. A uh, girl's doing a Wicked of the Witch, uh, Wizard of Oz number. I'm doing a Scooby-Doo number. I'm just, uh, it's a bunch of really cute nerd girls celebrating all these things that we like, and we hope that we can come and share it with you. Uh, Two, yesterday I went on a road trip with said ladies, and we ended up at this place called Hillbilly Hot Dogs, which looks like, it's essentially an abandoned car graveyard that all of these derelict school buses and other vehicles have been scooped out and made into even derelictor restaurants with a hillbilly, slightly post-apocalyptic theme, and it was the coolest fucking thing. And if you're really into, like, weird abandoned art installations and intensely deep-fried food, uh, go check it out. It's in West Virginia somewhere. I sure don't know geography. That's it. All right, guys, what do you say we stop this bullshit and start rolling some dice? Watch out. Dice are just a, a, a simile of mankind. Kill the dice. Yeah. This has been a production of Alien Familiar Media. You can find past episodes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. This production is protected under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, attribution, no derivatives license. Music for this episode is Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale and can be found at freemusicarchive.org.